In today's video, I'm going to be playing the recording I did of the webinar I did for all the people on my email newsletter. I cover all the different secrets I had from sending over a million cold emails, talking about all the different things you should prioritize when you're sending cold emails. And then I did a big workshop session, answered questions for people for about an hour, just going over all the different questions they had, lead gen related, cold email related, and help them answer that. If you guys wanna catch one of these live next time, subscribe to the newsletter below over at moreleadsmoremoney.com and you can maybe come and see one of these live but this was the initial pilot run if you want to take a look at the video stick around and i'm excited for you to watch what i'm just going to be covering is secrets from a million cold email sent so this is a screenshot I took yesterday from my analytics dashboard so this is just tracked analytics i've sent about 1.25 million uh emails that are attributed to the current dashboard i have that's not including all the people I do consulting for all the stuff that is from like previous sending tools before, you know, midway through last year, also like the accounts are unattributed. So probably sent close to like 2 million cold emails. Uh, so I have like, you know, decent amount of knowledge on the topic, but yeah, we'll just dive in. So what I'm going to cover is why you should listen to me, what actually drives results when sending cold emails. Cause I know there's a lot of hoopla. People talk about, you know, this and that or whatever they think actually drives results when in reality, there's only a few things. And then for the majority of this session, webinar, workshop session, we're just going to answer questions, see what you guys have, and then just trying to address that. So I'm going to try and wrap this up pretty quick so we can save plenty of time for Q&A. But why you should listen to me? Who am I? For a lot of you guys, you're probably on the newsletter. So you probably know a little bit about me, but my name is Matt. Uh, I send a little over 200,000 emails a month for our clients across a variety of industries at our agency, Anibo Marketing. I also teach cold email strategy at 300 other agencies, consultants, B2B companies inside a mastermind that charges $10,000 to join. And then I have the newsletter, which if you guys are here on the call today, you're probably on it because that's where I threw the link in. Now, talking about proof, you know, why you should trust me, I have a zillion case studies, not going to bore you to death with those. But here's some recent wins from the last two weeks from clients inside the agency. This was literally from yesterday. We had a client who we booked a call from cold email. And within a day of it getting booked, he ended up closing him. So it was like, we booked the call. That was two days ago. Then he closed them on the call or probably a couple minutes after. So from when we booked the call to when I closed 24 hour turnaround time, again, this isn't the norm, but this is just showing you like, if you really nail the cold email stuff in, you have your sales process, right? You're selling something that people want. You can see killer results. This is a client. Uh, we got 10 calls booked within the first 10, K, uh, 10 days of going live with a new campaign. This is a screenshot from the first five days. This was from yesterday. We booked three meetings within three hours for a client. Had a client who closed a 2K trial off of an email or a meeting we set from them. And this is a client who closed six people through a system that we helped them build out. So again, cold email works. You just have to implement, get the right stuff in place and you know, make sure you're truly harnessing things properly. So now diving in, you know, enough about me, how you can actually get results with cold email, sending it at scale. These are really just the things I'm going to cover or the stuff that you should be focusing on. Because if you guys are following any of the other cold email guys in the space or just anything lead gen related, there's probably a lot of noise what people talk about. They say, hey, you got to focus on your subject lines. You got to do this and that. But I'm just going to dive in and talk about what actually drives real results with cold emails at scale. So there's a million things that sound important whenever you're trying to do lead gen or anything uh, kind of in the space. Deliverability, personalization, people are talking about AI, chat GPT, crazy stuff there. Tools like Clay, response management, sending looms to people, sending emails on the weekend, script writing, segmentation, lead scraping. There's all these buzzwords of like what people talk about, but there's only a few things that you should really focus all of your attention on to make sure that you're getting really good results with any sort of you know lead gen, cold email campaigns you're running at scale. So here are the four small things, or I guess big things you should be focusing on and why you should be to make sure you're getting the best results from cold email. And I'm gonna break all four of these down. But the four that we're gonna be talking about is having a good offer, making sure your deliverability is on point, making sure you're saying enough volume and then having relevant emails. I'm gonna dive into all these pieces, why they're important, how you can actually do this yourself. So they offer, so this is something Everyone, this is kind of like a dead horse that everyone keeps beating at this point of, oh, you need a good offer. Alex Ramosi, his book, $100 million offers covers a lot of it, but everyone's using this buzzword. You need to have a good offer. You need to have a good offer. But like, what does that tangibly mean? Because offer is just a word. All it really boils down to is people need to want the thing that you're selling. Like that's the only, when people say offer, it's just the thing you're selling. And 
The crucial point here is that you need to make sure that you're selling something that people want. This is where 90% of people mess things up. This is not only going to make your cold emails not effective if you're not selling something that people want, it's going to make your whole business completely fail. So if you sell something that people don't want, nothing's going to work, your campaign's going to flop, and candidly, your business or whatever channel you're using outside of cold email is really not going to work. So not only true for cold email, but the chances your offer will perform well on Google ads, referrals, and your cold calls, your cold emails, it's all pretty much the same. If you're just selling something that people don't want, then no matter what marketing channel you're going to use is going to fail. And so this is why I always emphasize like before you do any of this lead gen, reaching out to people, running emails at scale, talking about all the subject clients and whatever, you need to make sure that what you're selling is something that people want. And that's really all it boils down to is if you sell something that people want and it solves a true pain point, has good risk reversal, you can do it in a reasonable amount of time and people want it, then you're going to have a, a great time with cold email. But yeah, there's plenty of content on this $100 million offers by Alex Ramos. He's the, the default book for anything related to this. A lot of you guys have probably read that. But yeah, cold email is a great channel for many B2B businesses. But if you're selling something that people don't want, it will not matter. This is the first thing I cover because yeah, if your business sucks, the, the emails are going to suck too. Deliverability. This is going to make or break your campaigns. This is like the one thing that I think a lot of people overlook. They talk about scripts, they talk about subject lines, this, that, AI personalization. But if people don't see the emails you're sending because they land in the spam folder, you're not going to generate any leads, any meetings, any calls like at all. And the reason why I bring this up is because like it's just overlooked, right? They prioritize other things, but this is really the heart of it. So, you know, this is just a rhetorical question because the answer is pretty obvious, but which billboard would you rather advertise on? Would you rather advertise your product or service on a billboard in the middle of the desert or on a crowded highway where everyone sees it? Very obviously, it should be the crowded highway where everyone sees it, uh, unless you're an idiot, in which case, you know, you probably wouldn't know, but you'd probably choose to advertise on the crowded highway. And it's very obvious why it's because people see it. You know, if you're putting all your effort into this advertising campaign in the case of cold email and no one's seeing your advertisement, that's a completely failed campaign. I'm stressing this because people cut corners on deliverability. They'll say, hey, let me add this image to the email. You know, I want to include this link to all these case studies oh, can I just squeeze out and send like 10 more emails out from each account? Or, you know, I only use three links in my email. I, you know, it's not that many. Don't do any of this, right? Anything that sacrifices deliverability in almost any context is not worth it. Because again, if no one is seeing your emails, like in the case of the billboard, if you have the most pretty fancy billboard, but it was in the middle of the desert, it doesn't matter. Or if you had the most plain and simple, you know, billboard advertisement and it was in a crowded highway, then it could be mediocre. But if it's getting in front of a lot of eyeballs, it's just going to perform way better. So again, you need to protect deliverability at all costs. If people don't see your cold emails and they're not going to convert because they don't see it in the first place. Inbox companies, you know, Google, Microsoft, all these email sending providers that people use, they're getting more strict as the day goes on and as more people send more cold emails. So what do you do? How do you make sure that you're focusing on deliverability properly? You set up your DMARC, your DKIM, your SPF records. This is backend tech. Whenever you're setting up any of your inboxes, if you've run any sort of campaigns, you're probably familiar with this, but make sure that these are in place. I know people who, you know, they'll, they'll run through their setup and they'll forget that they didn't set up one of their records and their campaign tanks because they're not landing in the inbox. Or don't set up more than two inboxes per one domain. And I guess there's a lot of nuance this because you can set up a bazillion inboxes, but then if you send one email per day, it's fine. But for most people, the typical strategy that we recommend, don't set up more than two inboxes per one domain on separate domains you can send emails from. Warm up your accounts for a minimum of 14 days. Again, you need to build up your reputation on your email accounts. Send less than 50 total emails per day per inbox. So this includes warm up, you know, reputation building emails, no links or images, period. Do not send any sort of links. Do not send any images in your emails because that will single-handedly ruin a lot of the performance you're, you have. Verify all your emails. Do this to keep your bounce rates low. And then no open rate tracking. So this is like semi-controversial. All I know is that open rate tracking is not helping your deliverability. There's no world where adding a pixel or adding a you know micro image into your email that sends data back to you know your sending tool to show you if someone opened or not. There's no universe where that's actually going to help your open rates. It's only going to hurt it. And so I'd recommend just keeping it disabled. And plus, open rate tracking is not really a useful metric. Volume. This is the next thing I want to cover. Really important stuff. After sending a million cold emails, you can have the best campaign in the world. But if not many people see it, going back to the deliverability, you're not going to get very many results. So cold email is a numbers game. Uh, there's an estimated 333 billion emails sent per day 
This is not per year, per month, per week. 333 billion emails sent per day, right? The average person gets about 100 emails per day in their inbox. And for a lot of you guys who are reaching out to CEOs, owners, founders, it's probably even more than that, right? So only a fraction of your market at any given time is ready to buy, which means that if you want to get the person who says, yeah, you caught me at the right place at the right time, you need to reach out to a lot of people because that's only, you know, 1% of the market, 2% of the market, or even less. And people are receiving more cold emails than ever before and more emails in general than ever before. Everyone's attention is being captured between social media, emails, and everything else that's going on. You need to make sure that you're pushing a significant volume. So the analogy, I use this all the time because it's the simplest way to illustrate this. For anyone who's running campaigns and you're sending, you know, I don't know, a thousand cold emails a week, right? If you take that amount of emails that you're sending and you double it, there's a very high probability that if you're reaching out to the same audience, you're just going to double the amount of meetings you're booking. So if you take how many cold emails you're sending right now and you see how many meetings that's booking you, if you just double it or triple it or 10x it, there's a very high likelihood chance that if you're reaching out to the same audience, you're going to get a proportional amount of results. So yeah, I, I have this in a couple other videos. This is the craziest chart you'll ever see. If you send more cold emails, you're going to get more meetings booked. Just like the billboard example, if you're on a more crowded highway, then you're going to get more calls booked. So like, this is just plain and simple, very high leverage. If you're not sending out enough emails, I see guys sending 20, 30 emails out per day. It's not going to cut it. Like with our clients, we send a minimum of 500 a day. And then for people that want like insane, you know, higher results, we go like a thousand, 2000 plus emails per day. So if you want to double the amount of people that you're booking, you need to double your emails. If you double the amount of people who see your emails, you're simply going to book twice as many meetings. So just send more emails. That's kind of my PSA here. And then relevance. Here's one of the last things I'm going to touch on. So if your emails aren't relevant to the person you're reaching out to, then the campaign's that you're setting up will not be effective. So this kind of takes into account, you know, a lot of people obsess about script writing and leads lists. This is kind of both those things together uh, in a different lens to kind of think this through. So sending an email out with low relevance is like sending an email out in a foreign language. The prospects that are going to be receiving your email are not going to understand what it is and they won't respond. People mess this up big time. I'm going to give a couple of examples that some of you guys in this call might be doing now. Not every CEO in the world wants to hear about your service. A lot of you guys, you're going into, you know, an Apollo or a list kit or one of these tools and you're saying, Hey, I'm going to reach out to CEOs, owners, founders, and I'm going to do everyone between a hundred head count and a thousand head count. You know, you click all these buttons in a dashboard, but when you really think about it, right? Like let's imagine you're selling a design subscription service. I know that's, you know, popular now, you know, your main value prop is you're helping taking the load off of marketing teams, uh, like time, effort, energy. Do you really think a CEO of a 500 headcount company is going to care about your service at all, right? Yes, they're a decision maker. Yes, they have budget authority. Yes, they check all the boxes, but like really sit and think, like put yourself in the shoes. Maybe someone on the call here owns a company that has 500 employees, but if you really sit and think like you own a company, you have 500 employees, there's a million things going on. There's, you know, they're putting out fires every single day. They have big budgetary stuff. They're probably doing tens of thousands of dollars, you know, payroll a day is what they, they're probably doing. So if they have all this stuff going on, they're probably not going to care about your $3,000, $5,000 a month marketing service. And if they're shelling out seven figures in payroll monthly, they're probably not gonna answer. They're probably not gonna get on a 30 minute call with you. And they're probably not gonna buy your service. They probably don't even care about anything that costs less than $5,000 a month or even $10,000 a month for that example. Like they probably spend 5,000 in a couple of hours just because of their payroll. All this to say is that you really need to think about your persona, the people you're targeting and what you're saying. And if that is relevant to them, like one of the best exercises I can give is making sure that, yeah, you sell something that people want and you're scraping relevant people and pretending like you are the person themselves and how, you know, you would perceive the email if you received it and you're in their shoes. A lot of people, again, they're sitting in the dashboards of their lead list building software. They're clicking all these high head counts or clicking all these random titles that sound like decision makers. But if you really sat down and thought about this person and what shoes they're in, you'll quickly understand why they're not responding to your email. So first thing I'll cover on relevance, just sell something that people want. This goes back to the beginning point. If you're selling something that people want, the email that you're sending is automatically not going to be relevant. We already covered this. The main point is making sure you're solving a real pain point in the market, making sure you're selling a solution that has a high probability of success, lowers the risk for a prospect, and it works quickly and doesn't require effort on their end. You add a guarantee, you sell something that people want, 
that's basically it. If you don't have a lot of those components, you're going to see a lot of people saying, I'm not interested. This email is not relevant and they're not going to want to get on the phone with you. The next thing is scraping the people that are relevant. So there's plenty of tools that can scrape leads, but this goes way beyond the tool. So a lot of people they're asking, oh, can we, should I use Crunchbase? Should I use Apollo? Should I use ListKit? Most of those tools do a great job. Like there's people who did really great with cold email prior to any of these tools existing, simply because they sat there and sourced people that were relevant to their service and that actually wanted to buy their product or service. So the main thing that I'd recommend as an exercise for everyone here of picking your right target, defining your ICP properly is sit down and go through the last five to 10 people that purchased your services and write down the traits they had. So if you're selling, let's go back to the example of a design service, right? What job titles led the purchasing decision? What industry were they in? What was their headcount? What trigger events led to them wanting to purchase? And if you answer all these questions, you'll realize that maybe the person who purchased your service is the marketing manager, not the CEO. And maybe you realize the industry, that most of the people purchased it as a white label solution, not as a standalone service. So then you should sell to other marketing agencies. If you realize that all the, you know, hey, I want to target big companies because they have a lot of money, but turns out that all the big companies have in-house departments that handle all of this. Making sure that you narrow all these things down. And then once you have this, you can reverse engineer in any of these lead platforms to see, okay, these are the people that actually purchase a service. And then, you know, you can reverse engineer from there. And the last thing I'll cover before we get into QA, you know, speaking directly to relevance is making sure you're sending an email that conveys specifically why they should want what you're selling. So writing a good email, having good copywriting. There's a lot of stuff you can talk about on copywriting. I have a video here on my YouTube uh, that you could watch after this uh, webinar, but there's a lot that can be said. The main short version stuff is explain why you're reaching out to them, explain what you're selling, explain any relevant piece of info and give clear next steps. Include all these things in your email because if you're just blabbering on, you make it really long, you don't have clear next steps, then no, you could have everything else right and people aren't going to convert. Yeah, make sure that the whole email is not more than a few sentences and it should be easily readable by a fifth grader. So that's all I had to cover in terms of like cold email, just big high level stuff, stuff that I'm seeing trends I'm seeing now, a lot of stuff that people are failing with. So that's what I had with the presentation here today. If you guys have any questions, comments, uh, anything you want to cover now, now is time where we can workshop. We can go through, cover, answer any of your questions and, and help you guys out here. So question, how do you ensure that you sell something that people really want? This is where I would say do market research. So if you are unsure that people want your product or service like one really easy thing let's say for the people here who already have established businesses if you're doing more than like 30 grand a month in revenue you're you know kind of at that run rate you can be pretty confident that people want what you're selling because you already have a past history of people purchasing what you're selling they might have been referrals so you know your offer might not be as strong for uh cold outreach but one of the best things you can do is number one, look at what competitors are doing in the space. If you see a company like, you know, Apollo and they're this giant company that sells data, there's a pretty big demand clearly for data, right? Apple, they've identified the pain point in the market that people want smartphones. And for the more tangible thing for everyone here is look around, see what people are buying in the market. So look at the cold emails that you're receiving, look at the ads that you're getting, look at the competitors that you see are doing well. And that is like kind of a wedge in the door to see what's kind of starting to work. And then from there, you can do market research and, you know, get more iteration feedback from the market. I would get on calls with people. Like one of the really simple things you can do with the cold email is do send out emails in the frame as, as if you're like uh, interviewing people or like a college student, you can say, Hey, I uh, just want to reach out to business owners to see what's like a big pain point that a lot of them are having. Would you be open to a quick 15 minute chat? And then you can talk to them and see if they have, you know, pain points that you can solve. And a lot of them really buck it down into like getting more clients, retaining those clients, you know, hiring staff. It's just look at what a lot of the other agencies are doing because they exist for a reason. All right, on to the next question. Can we add a website link in the signature? I would not recommend that. I know that people do that. And like I said, it's like, you can definitely make it work. And I know people who do it, they get good deliverability numbers. But the way I look at it is that if you are adding any sort of friction or any sort of these links, images, anything like that, you're just increasing the chance that you're going to land in the spam folder. And I do everything I can to make sure that my, you know, highway is, is one of those full highways crowded with people. And so everyone sees my billboard because you're sacrificing the traffic in exchange for having a website link, which ultimately isn't going to affect the decision-making uh, process that much. All right. On to the next question. 
Darren asks, what video marketing tools like SendSpark? I'm assuming, do I use video marketing tools like SendSpark? I don't use any of those tools for the reason mentioned before, which is I don't like sending any links or images in any of my emails because it just helps with deliverability. Uh, if I'm pronouncing that right. So no links in my main campaign revolved around placing my Fiverr profile link. What's the alternative? I would say that you just go for a direct call to action. So you say, hey, here's my services. If you know you want to place your Fiverr profile, maybe because you have a handful of services, I would state what your services are. And if they say, yes, I'm interested, then you can follow up and maybe send them a link with your profile or only send it whenever it's prompted. Because if you're mass blasting your link, Google, Microsoft, all these providers, they catch on pretty quickly that like, hey, this person's doing mass sending activity. And so it's it's really not going to work out very well. I was booking appointments for my client with a really good script for web design. Then he wasn't happy with my script. I was outlining his case study. He told me he doesn't want to make promises. So and I switched the script to booking appointments. What should I do? That's kind of a client comms question. He wasn't happy with my script. He told me he doesn't want to make promises. I mean, you kind of have to level with your client. He wasn't happy with the script, even though it outlined his case study. I can answer like lead gen agency questions. That's kind of like a whole different ballpark. But a lot of this stuff kind of boils down to client comms and just setting good frame and expectations as an agency owner, making sure that you tell them like, hey, if you want your campaigns to succeed, we have to do it this way or this way. Another thing you can do is ask them to split test what you're doing against, you know, what you'd want to be doing. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to jump over to Nico. And then, yeah, if you guys want to just drop Q in the chat, so then we can have more in-depth conversations, we can do that as well. But uh, yeah, we'll start off with Nico and yeah, let's dive in. Yeah, I've got a few here. Uh, I'll be fast. Uh, basically, I had one client call, a sales call that I just jumped on and he wanted to reach out to a somewhat specific market. It was like equipment manufacturers and dealerships and things of that nature. And so before the call, I went on Apollo and tried to do my best to see if it made sense. Like if there are enough people in the ICP that I could actually reach out to. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the list that I created in Apollo was like, there were like 30,000 people, but it was maybe like 40, 50% accurate, if that. And so my question is, when someone has a target market that seems hard to target through something like Apollo or ListKit, but you want to take them on, you just don't know if you're going to be able to like really precisely target those people. What is your approach? Yeah, so I would say for this, there's a couple things you can do. So the first thing I would say is like expectation setting wise, you could just tell them that like, let's assume that that is your capability. That's all you're capable of really doing. You just level with the client and say, hey, you know, it looks like most of the leads we're reaching out to aren't going to be totally accurate. Is it okay if we run this campaign? I would say you can definitely do better than that. Like one of the things you can do, I know with Clay, this is where I'd say Clay and a lot of these like more sophisticated tools really have their merit is by using like chat GPT agents. So you can use Clay and then you can use, uh, there's a function in Clay called Clayagent where you can have it go and scrape their website. And you can give it like this ultra long prompt where it's like, hey, website and tell, like check to see if they have this, 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 this. If yes, then score it, you know, score it on a scale of one to 10. So then you can have it have like a confidence interval where if chat GPT says that there's a seven out of 10 probability or higher, then you include that in the lead list. And if it's lower than that, then you can scrap it out. So that's like a more sophisticated way of doing it. Uh, you can also try and use tools like IO where there's like lookalike searches. Again, I think you're probably gonna run into similar stuff, but I think there's probably a higher chance that you can either find like a directory, you can use clay, or you can just layer on a ton of keywords and get more accurate searches because 50% I would say is like kind of at the threshold where I'm like, I don't know if I'd run a, run this campaign. I'd want to at least minimum have it like 80% of the people we're reaching out to at scale are relevant. Ideally, like way more than that, but that's kind of like the barrier where I'm like, okay, 50%, you're, half your signing volume is just going in the trash. So yeah, totally. My thought process there is like, okay, I, I know ocean clay would be awesome. That adds another like $600 a month in expenses all of a sudden. And I'm, I've been trying to scale a model where it's like kind of like Ori's model charging a thousand bucks a month and a 10% rev share. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it's like, if you are using these expensive tools and you don't have a ton of clients, the, the math doesn't math pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, like, is there, would you ever recommend trying to like include manual outreach then in the automation process? Or like, what are the options there if your business isn't generating like a ton of revenue to 
substantiate those kind of expensive tools? I mean, I would just pass it off to the client to say, hey, like this is option one is that we can reach out and it'll be 50% accurate for this cost or, you know, layers on this type of cost. So I'd pass it on to the client. I'd say this is more like less of a lead gen question, more of a business strategy question. But still, I would say that the way you'd approach this, just do a cost benefit analysis. Like, okay, well, if we reach out to 20,000 people and half of them are accurate and that costs $500, or we can reach out to 5,000 people and they're 100% accurate, but doubles the cost. Is it worth it to do that? You know, that's, that's up to you to kind of like play around with the numbers. I would say in your case, like, I would definitely play around with more keywords and filtering because there's a pretty good chance that with tools like Apollo and um, ListKit, you can play around with the keywords, you can play around with other additional stuff and filter it on top. And then, yeah, there's only so much limitations with, you know, the cheaper tools, but hopefully that helps. Yeah, that does help. That's awesome. So yeah, if you want to ask a question, drop something in the chat. I'm going to try and limit it for the people I bring up to like five minutes or less, just so we get through because I can see there's a ton of questions in here already, but we're going to go on. How deep do you personalize emails when you send 500 emails per day? How do you do it? Do you use Clay? Do you put the offer in the first email or in the first email has a lead magnet? So this is like a handful of questions. The first question is how do you personalize your emails when you send 500 emails per day? This varies depending on a lot of factors. I would say that a lot of the AI personalization craziness and kind of alluding back to the presentation I had, there is a lot of stuff that doesn't really matter. I've talked to people who run these high scale campaigns with insane AI personalization. I've personally run a couple of those where it scrapes their website, it gets like their main pain points, it pitches them custom ideas. And for the most part, the results are like next to no different. Like I'm talking like we'll send 5,000 emails to one audience, 5,000 emails to another audience. And the meeting booked margin is like single digit percentage. And the last time I ran one of those campaigns, the non-personalized campaign actually performed better. So this all comes back to like in the presentation I was saying earlier, making sure that you're having relevant emails. Like I would take any day sending an offer to a person that needs it than having some AI personalization. Like a super, I'll give a super extreme example. If you sent the most personalized, relevant, you manually wrote it, you mailed them something to their house with your offer, but it was someone who like, let's say you're doing a uh, design subscription service. You did the most personalized, best email offer in the world and your service costs $4,000, but you're sending it to someone who's not a business owner. Like it doesn't matter what level of personalization or whatever you do. The thing that you're selling, the audience that you're selling it to is completely irrelevant. So none of those emails are really gonna matter if you don't nail the targeting piece right and the offer piece right. So I would say like personalization, there's stuff that you can do. The way that I do it at scale really cost effectively is segmenting audiences. So if you're reaching out, you want to personalize, you're reaching out to marketing agencies, you scrape only marketing agencies and you write your emails in a way that appeals to them. So you, you might use verbiage around that. Or if you're reaching out to oil and gas companies, you're going to use industry specific jargon uh, in those campaigns. Using the lead magnet in your first email, I, I like to do that. Like, And for those of the people, when he's talking about lead magnet, it's in reference to like giving away something for free. I like to do that. It doesn't really matter which email you do, but um, but yeah. Hey, um, thank you for taking your time. So my question to you is when you talk about having a good offer, do you add it into your copy? Because I'm in the email marketing niche. For example, my offer is we will add 50000 to $250,000 to your MRR in 60 days or your money back. Like if you were to add that to a, to a cold email campaign, I think that gets sent to spam, right? Like just because of the numbers and the guarantee and all these things. So do you add your offer in the campaign or is there like a way around it? I think that one of the things that's overrated is spam words. Like people worry about it excessively. Like yeah. I wouldn't intentionally put a bunch of spammy words in your email because it does increase the likelihood chance you're going to go to spam. But for the most part, I've seen people use some pretty, like I ran campaigns to get the same deliverability reply rates results that have five spam words and like zero spam words. I think a lot of the other factors like adding a link is a lot more dangerous than saying the word like revenue or having a dollar sign. Yeah. But I would try and limit it when possible because I think it it is definitely a factor at the end of the day. So my answer to that is I would say it's just split test it. Like run a campaign where you don't say it and run a campaign where you do say it and see what the results are. I have a feeling that even that like it's probably not going to affect your deliverability that much. And then having that bold claim with a guarantee is going to do a lot better than not having that. Okay, perfect. And then I have one more thing. When mm -hmm. you're outreaching for email marketing, what angle do you do you, do you go at it? For example, 
I was talking to Christian Bonier over at Client Ascension. I had a call with him and he said that the angle that they utilize is doing a loom for their prospects. So they say that, oh, we signed up to your email list and then they, oh, we have a loom ready for you guys. Like what, what angle do you utilize when doing lead gen? So I would say, again, it's something you probably have to split test. And if I sat in here to the 80 people watching and said, hey, use this angle, like yeah. everyone's going to copy and paste it. I would say that like, and I made a video recently on like call to actions, that I think work really well. I would try a bunch of different things. So I would try, you know, like pitching a short call, just super direct, like, hey, do you want to jump on a five minute call to see if I can help you? I would try a lead magnet angle where you give something away for free. So like, hey, can I build you a free email flow just to show you how good my process is? Or hey, just some sort of free value that's very tangible. I would split test that angle. I would try the loom angle. However, personally, in my experience, I haven't seen very good results with it. You get a lot of positive replies, people saying, yes, send me the loom. But about 10% of the people that get the loom end up converting into a call. Those are the numbers I see after like consulting. I've consulted more than a dozen people who use that strategy. And so it works like it's up to you if you want to invest the time creating all those looms to getting those results. So yeah, it, it really depends on what you're going after, or, you know, the time commitment you want to take. But the short, the long and short of it is split test. Like come up with creative ideas, see what you can give away for free and just run volume to all those different segments with the different angles. Uh, and the more unique you can be, the better. Because yeah, if I sat here and I'm like, hey, give a free email flow build out, then like everyone on this call here is going to do it. And e-commerce is one of the most like picked upon industries I've seen with email. Not that it can't work, but like if you're sending something, if like all these cold email guys are probably doing like similar stuff uh, to that audience. So that's just something to be mindful of. All right, man. Th thank you so much. That's it. Awesome. Appreciate you. Uh, Conrad says, can you please go over your opinion on how to personalize emails effectively? So yeah, going back to the earlier point, I think the way that you do it is with segmentation. I think I might have like an old deck where I, I talk about that. Effectively, like the easiest way you can personalize your emails without going crazy with the AI stuff, which I don't even consider is like real personalization. Like if I say, hey, I came across your profile. I noticed you went to XYZ High School. By the way, here's my service. Like that's not really personalization. And then again, going back to relevance, it's not really a relevant reason of why you're reaching out. Just because you notice someone's high school, it's not going to increase your conversion rate. What I like to do is segment audiences and then write specific stuff to those audiences. Let's go back to the design subscription example, right? If you're selling it as a white label service, you're going to other marketing agencies and saying, hey, this is a service you can use as part of your fulfillment. Then you scrape only people that would use the service as part of their fulfillment and run an angle targeted specifically to those people. And then if you have anything unique that you can call out, I'd put that in the campaign. And it's as simple as that, right? Group, like the way that you scrape the list is the way that you're going to personalize the email. So if you, if you chop it up and you have a list of people that are in a certain city, then you can use that in your email. Say, hey, I noticed you're in city. But for the most part, I'd say the bigger piece on personalization is there's a couple levels to it. There's like level one, which is just saying like, hey, I noticed this thing about you. But the better thing to do is tie in the personalization with your offer. So get, I'll give an example. Let's say you're selling a HubSpot implementation service. So you're you know, going to companies and you're helping them set up their HubSpot, right? You could just reach out to people and say, hey, I noticed you're from you know, Georgetown, Pennsylvania, wherever. Here's my HubSpot service. That's really not going to do much for you. But if you reach out to people who are following HubSpot on LinkedIn and you say, hey, I noticed you're following HubSpot on LinkedIn. The reason why I reached out is to see if you needed help with your HubSpot. It's not only personalized because you're calling out something that's unique, like, hey, I noticed you're following HubSpot on LinkedIn, but your, your service directly ties in with the personalization. So effective personalization is more than just calling out something unique about them. It's tying in what you noticed with your service and making sure that you're scraping effective list. Yeah, I guess. I guess that's all I have to say. All right. So going over to John, when deliverability tanks, should I just rest the email inboxes for 30 days or should I delete the accounts, build new email accounts, form up on the same on the same domains and warm those up? So that's a good question. I would say the the easy or like the the hundred percent hit rate, this will always work, is just create new inboxes under new domains. If you create new domains, you create new inboxes, it's guaranteed to work. It'll cost you two weeks of setup time and it'll you know cost a little bit of extra money, but that's guaranteed to solve the problem. You could rest them for 30 days, put them on warm up, not send any new people, but that's not guaranteed to fix your inboxes. I have recovered emails in the past for campaigns that I've run where the sending volume was a little bit too high. So we like slowed down the sending volume. We gave it a couple of weeks and it recovered back to normal. But I've also seen plenty of cases where someone maybe 
sent a list, you know, an emails out to a list of 5,000, 10,000 people that were unvalidated. The bounce rate was ultra high. The reputation got permanently destroyed and uh, we had it warm up for like two months and it didn't recover. So I would say like easy answer, make new domains. If you want to try and recover it, I would say like leave it on warm up for a couple of weeks and then come back to it in a couple of weeks, see if any of the results change and then you can make a, make a decision from there. Well, let's jump over to Dwayne Clark. You have a question? Hey Matt, uh, thanks for hosting this. I appreciate it. So the first question is, how has growing your personal brand affected your code outreach efforts? Have Has it been more positive replies you've been seeing as you increased your presence on YouTube? So I would say specific to my cold email campaigns, it helped me the most with my sales process more than anything. I don't think there's like a clear difference where it's like last year I was not posting any YouTube videos and I was getting this response rate. And then a year from now I'm posting YouTube videos and I'm getting a way higher response rate where it does help is like you get on the call with them. And then after the call is over, you can send them over your YouTube videos. You say, Hey, check out my videos and they can be more nurtured and in your pipeline in that way. So they can like be kind of auxiliary around your sales process. And also it works great as a pre-call follow-up. So like, you know, hey, I reached out to you, booked you in for a call. And then before the call, I'm like, hey, here's a YouTube video I recorded. And they can sit there, watch me for 30 minutes. And then when they come to the call, they trust me and like me more. So I'd say it serves more specific to cold email. I don't think it's helping my cold email campaigns a ton. I can't really attribute or tell that much, but it definitely is helping the conversion rate prior to the call and after the call, because they have a higher chance of learning more about me before the call and then a higher chance of being aware of me after the call too. So that's where I'd say like most of the help is. And in your experience, does a demand generation or a demand capture offer perform better for you? I do want to give context to this. For one of the clients that we're working with, they work with like Fortune 500 companies. We figured out that like these people are going to this certain event at this certain time. And we were just about to email them before. And we're kind of capturing that demand. We were able to book in like three calls with that. Mm -hmm. um, but on the flip side with generating demand, we're like... And this is the e-commerce in the e-commerce space. Yeah. It was just like, we're like talking about like profits and we mail like a thousand people and they're like, no, like majority. So I know it might be subjective, but what have you seen work for you when you kind of approach these difficult situations, like a demand capture, demand generation offer? Yeah. So if they're selling, and I think this is outside of demand capture, demand generation, what you're really asking is like, what are effective ways to target people in a way that, you know, gets attention. And I would say that the best campaigns you're ever going to run are to those hyper segmented targets. So it's like you're selling a service that sells the e-commerce, right? And there's a big e-commerce event coming up and you reach out to those people going back to like, what is relevant personalization? It's not only calling out something that's unique. It's also calling out something that ties in of your service, right? So it's like, Hey, I know you're going to this e-commerce event. So I figured you might want this service. Anything <laughs> like that, those campaigns where you can get super hyper, hyper segmented, those are going to outperform your broad campaigns always, right? I would say the two types of campaigns that you're going to run they get really good results or either the hyper segmented, like really small audience, really targeted, like the campaign you were referring to. And then if you want to run one at scale, so like everyone who's an e-commerce brand owner, you need to give away something for free or make your offer super attractive. If your offer is not that attractive at scale, like you need to, it's, it's really, you need a warm audience or you need to have a really good offer. Those are the only two things. So like when you're reaching out to the really small audience, it's almost a warm audience. You're coming at it in a way that you sound personal, that they could have thought that you even manually wrote that email. But if you're going really broad to like something where you're not calling out something super relevant, you don't have anything super unique. You just need a really strong product or service with a guarantee. Like that definitely helps or performance basis. That's, that's how I'd run it. Okay. And after this is the last question, does mm -hmm. the way you do inbox management change based on the type of offer you're doing? So a quick kind of like contextual example is like for one client, they're, they're doing video editing. They've worked with like the top industry leaders in one niche. And we're like thinking like, oh, we might have to bring them to a, uh, a lead page, take them outside of the email. And after from there, try to bring them back. Or would it be better if, like, if they, if we're like, Hey, do you want more information? They say, yes. We're just like write another email back to them saying like, this is a little bit more information about the service. And after like, go for the call book, like, which one do you think is better? Kind I of? think it's better to go more direct. Just like, Hey, I have a question. Here it is. Um, I don't try and like, and this is like a concept like click funnels and advertising in general. Like you want a clear straight line down to your product or service. If you take someone, you're like, Hey, check out this. And it's not getting them closer to a call. Like the way that you want to think about the funnel is is the subject line gets people to open the email. 
The intro of the email gets them to read more or the offer gets them intrigued in the call. The call to action pushes them to the call in some way. Whether you say, hey, do you want to see my portfolio? They say yes. And then you get them to the call. You need to make sure that what you're doing is directionally getting them closer to a call. And if you're going somewhere that's getting them further from a call, then I wouldn't do that. So everything you're doing needs to get them pushed down further in the funnel. So subject line gets them to read the email. Personalization gets them to read the email. Offer gets them intrigued in the call. Call to action gets them to the call. Response management gets them to the call. And then the call is where you do the selling so that you can you know, sell the service. Okay. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate the kind of answers. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate you as well. What's your take on AI personalization? I think we already covered that. What has been the highest converting copy for a done for you content agency? Obviously, I'm not just going to like disclose all my client campaigns, but I would say that for a done for you content agencies, the main things you want to pitch if you're doing any sort of design related service or service where you have like a deliverable is send them examples of your portfolio. That's like the one key piece I'd give is if someone sent me a cold email about, hey, I can make your YouTube videos. The first question I'm going to ask is like, is this guy's YouTube videos even good? Before I get on a call with you, before I consider any of your service. And, and this goes for everything I talked about it earlier, which is try and step in your prospect's shoes and think of what are the objections that they're going to get. The first thing I'm going to ask about any person who's pitching me a YouTube service is show me what you've done. And so I would like the angles I've seen work well for any design content, anything like that is, Hey, can I send you some examples of my content? Or if you're doing manual cold outreach without like any of the crazy, uh, high scale stuff, I would just manually say like, Hey, I made this free video for you and then show off how good your videos are. And then that'll help. Is there any tool you use to keep an eye on email deliverability? Uh, if you're using any sort of warm up tool, there's like the, the warm up percentage, which is an okay indication, but I like to use uh, mailreach.co, M A I L R E A C H.co, not affiliated with them, but it lets you send like your email out to like 10 inboxes that are Google and Microsoft and then, you know, see which one performs better. Outlook versus Google, both of those get the job done. Google, I say, is a little bit touchier than Outlook, which is why I prefer Outlook. But I still have plenty of campaigns running on Google and they're they're chugging along just fine. Uh, what are your thoughts on hyper-personalization? I think I've added way too many triggers in my email using Clay. I think like a lot of this personalization stuff and going back to like what people focus on, which is versus what's important. Personalization is this like never ending thing, which is how do I personalize? How do I personalize? Like I would focus more on making sure your lead list is super clean and making sure your offer is good more than the personalization. But I would just split test, like run a low personalization campaign and run a high personalization campaign and see if it matters. Because what I've realized after sending a million cold emails and talking to a ton of other people that have is that it doesn't have as much of an effect as many people think it does. Like, sure, if you can get that feeling where it feels like the person manually wrote the email, that's great. But a lot of people are sophisticated that these are automated emails and the personalization doesn't matter as much as the offer. Like going back, if you have the most personalized email with your design subscription service to a person who doesn't run a business, like there's a 0% chance they're going to ever respond or get on a call. So above everything else, make sure you have a relevant offer and a relevant lead list of people that you're reaching out to. Because I would take any day, like if you gave me a list of a hundred people that want to buy cold email services, like of course there's no crystal ball because if there was, that'd be phenomenal, right? But I would take that any day, like terrible copywriting, terrible everything. Obviously you want your deliverability to be good. But if I had a hundred people that I know want to purchase that service, that's going to perform way better than like, just spraying out to people with all these hyper-personalized things because they just, they're just they the right person at the right time. Do you have a video or framework where you're to choose where and who to scrape? I, I have a video on my channel, I think somewhere where it's like how to scrape. There's a lead scraping video somewhere on the channel. I'm probably gonna make a new one because I haven't made one in a minute, but framework, I, I discussed it earlier in the, the doc, which is, you know, I'm gonna send this doc in the chat so you guys can have it. Um, But the framework is basically just making sure that you are looking at your past clients and seeing what the personas are and reaching out to those people. Or you can look at your competitors' clients and see what they have. I'm just going to throw this in the Zoom chat. This was the, the doc that I was I was showing earlier. Uh, what are your thoughts on hyper-personalization? When and who to scrape? How do you measure when campaigns don't perform well? I would focus on uh, KPIs. So in our agency, we have KPIs we track. Like the most common ones that we worry about is email to sending or email sent to meeting booked ratio. And what we see as our average across um, most clients is it's roughly about for every 300 to 400 people we reach out to, or about every thousand to 1200 emails we send, we get a call booked. So if you are sending out 5,000 emails and you're getting one call booked, I would say that's like a very poor performing campaign. There's something wrong. Or if you're sending out 300 emails, and you're getting a call booked, that's a very strong campaign. 
So that's probably the biggest KPI track. And then downstream from that, I'd keep track of reply rates. If your reply rates start dipping, that might be a sign that your deliverability is going bad. And then I wouldn't track open rates uh, because yeah, that doesn't help deliverability. Uh, Jacob asks, what is the best technology stack for a person who wants to run everything himself at the beginning? Domain, Gmail account, Clay, instantly. I'd say the easiest tech stack to run is, yeah, you want to use one of the, the big uh, sending or email providers, Google, Microsoft. I'm not a big fan of a lot of the other like private servers. There's definitely some that I've seen work, but long-term, it sounds like most of the ones that I've seen, I'm not going to name names, seem like they taper off in the long run. So you're like, they're, a lot of them are pretty cheap, but it, their longevity is not good. And I have seen private servers that are more expensive and they work great. But I would say, keep it simple. Use Google or Microsoft. Tech stack, I would say Apollo or ListKit for data. ListKit is probably the easiest to use. I think Apollo is slightly cheaper depending on what plan you're using, or ListKit might be cheaper now to validation update. I would look at Apollo and ListKit for data. For sending, I would say instantly or smart lead, they both get the job done. A smart lead, I would say has a little bit more sophisticated features. Instantly is like easier UI. Um, and they have the data built in, so that's all right. And I honestly wouldn't worry too much about Clay unless you have a specific use case for that. Um, a lot of people obsess about Clay. It's a great tool. And for the people who know what they're doing, it's insanely powerful. But if you're trying to run your first cold email campaign ever, I would say like cut Clay because it's just going to add a lot of complexity and cost. Janny asks, if I sell explainer videos, would it be perfect to add explainer video link to YouTube videos, explainer videos? That'd be kind of perfect. I would not like, as we talked about before, if you add links or images to your emails, just very high chance you're going to go to spam. So I'd recommend sending it in a follow-up. Say like, hey, came across your website, blah, blah, blah. Would you be open to seeing one of our explainer videos? Or would you open to me making you a sample explainer video? I and mean, something like that can demonstrate expertise. And then you can send that on the follow-up. Frederick asked, was your email sending strategy during the summer? Do you pause your campaigns when people are most on vacation? The only time I pause campaigns is really on the major holidays. So like 4th of July, Christmas, what else? Like New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, like the ones where 90% of the people are going to be out of office. Because if you just pause for every setting, like last week was Easter and the week before there's like spring break, there's always holidays. There's always something going on. But if you just pause for every one of those holidays, like you're, you're going to miss out on a lot of leads. How's your signature look if it doesn't contain links? It's just first name, last name, you know, like all the can spam compliance stuff. And, and that's basically it. Just very basic without any links. Dennis, yeah, you threw your question in below that. Been at 25%, 35% open rate for the last few months using verified lead lists. Use more than creative subject lines. Outlook accounts, 1%. Bounce rate, what else should I look into targeting B2B SaaS founders? So first thing I'd say there, double check that your custom domain tracking is set up properly because if that's not set up, then your open rates are going to be inaccurate. I assume you have that set up properly. The next thing I would say is I would not even track opens. The reason why is it lowers deliverability. And I would use reply rates as the metric that you care about. So if you're getting like above a 1% or like 2% reply rate, you're probably fine. And if you're getting below that, then that's an issue. The reason why open rates also aren't even a after, an accurate metric. So like the way that open rates work is that there is like a one by one transparent pixel that gets put in an email that you're sending out. And whenever your email provider, whether that's Google or Microsoft or a private server, loads that image, there's code in it that sends it back to the email sending tool and says, hey, this person's opened it. Now, the interesting paradox is that different sending or different email providers load the pixel differently. So like Google loads it. I think it like preloads it or it loads it in a way that every time you open up your email, it'll always load properly. And so when you send emails to, you know, Google accounts, the open rate is reported higher versus if you send a Microsoft accounts, it's reported lower because there's like security defaults of like, hey, does this image automatically load or not? All this to say is that your open rates might fluctuate, not even because of the true open rate, but because of the providers you're sending to. So for a lot of these different reasons, like if you target up market, you're going to notice your open rates are lower, which partially could be because you're landing in spam, but it's also because bigger companies use more sophisticated email servers and have different spam filters and different image loading policies. So all that to say, I wouldn't even focus on open rates. I'd focus going back to the email sent to meeting booked ratio. How many emails you're sending? How many meetings is that booking? And then I would iterate from there. And if you think it's a deliverability issue, I'd go back to some of the stuff I talked about earlier, which is like the immediate deliverability thing I would say for you is turn off open rate tracking because I think that'll help. And then also make sure you're not using links, make sure you're following the best practices. Try sending less emails per inbox. And then if that doesn't help, then create new inboxes. If that doesn't help, then that means that you're probably delivering fine. It's just like 
an ICP type thing. So all that to say, don't obsess about open rates, focus more on reply rates, and then yeah, go from there. You said that uh, the KPI would be just like uh, 2% reply rate if i'm on nine percent total reply rate this means it's fine you were talking about not interested but uh, the total one two percent yeah yeah so if your total reply rate you said it's nine percent yeah so and also i'd keep in mind it might be tracking it as a percentage of the opens so like make sure it's calculated on the amount of email sent if it's nine percent of the people you're sending emails out to so like take the amount of leads and then divide it by the reply rate if that's nine percent then i would say your emails are probably not having a delivery issue there's a low likelihood chance of that if it's based on opens if nine percent of the 20 percent are open then you're probably on that lower end of that kpi but like honestly if i were you i would just create 20 new inboxes do everything by the, the book make it as easy solutions possible. you mean yeah yeah because yeah, uh, you could you know you could go down the road but you know if your warm-up scores are healthy yeah. and all the other stuff's good. You mentioned that your KPI would be like uh, one meeting booked per 300 emails. And on the lower end, you're looking at one meeting booked per 500 emails. Yeah. Leads. So that's like people reached out to and yeah. the email number. So if you're looking at total email sends, I would say one in every like thousand to 1500 emails. If you're kind of in that range. So let's say you send... 15,000 emails and you book 10 meetings, I would say that's pretty good, right? Or if you're booking 20 emails at scale, right? If you manually do stuff, it's going to be higher. But if you're getting in that one email booked for every thousand or so, 1,500 or so email sent, that's good. If you're at 2,000, I'd still say that's fine. But if you're in like three, four, 5,000 emails sent to get a call book, that's not, I would say that's like below, you know. Yeah, yeah. So one call per 1K emails, because you know, I think when we started like a year ago, People were looking at one sale per thousand emails, but now it's like game changed. <laughs> yeah, I would. Old I times. even think at the time those were a little bit aggressive KPIs, but yeah, I I know what you mean. Um, and you're not sold on all this hype about Clay because I hear you say that even with all these fancy automations and hyper personalization, like more volume and nice offer still beats all these fancy tools as usual. To go deeper on the personalization, if you can segment a really good audience, like we were talking about earlier, uh, I forgot who's up here, but he was talking about like- they were able group to... uh, where followers I think you're doing with Eamon. Yeah. yeah, those kill, those do phenomenal. So like that type of personalization works great, but like, hey, I noticed you went to this high school and here's like five campaign ideas. Yeah. Like that helps a little bit, but like good offer. At least. So some of your best performing campaigns now are, Hey, I saw that you follow this one new, really niche guy. By the way, we're in this space. Let's chat. That's one of the campaigns to performing well. A lot of the other ones are just really great offer, and there's there's a few more. But you know, not do you still show. bother like putting the risk reversals in campaigns? For example, I stopped doing that because I felt like it attracts um, the wrong audience. Not sure if you felt it in your agency, but you know, you could feel these people that come there to the call because of the guarantee. And who come there for the main offer, you know? So what's your take on that? I have noticed that actually a majority of the people that I've booked with a guarantee don't even ask about the guarantee on the call. Probably only 20% even ask about it. I think it's better to put that just to get them on the call. And then like you can talk about the terms and stipulations. Yeah. A majority of the people I honestly don't even think they even remember what the email I sent them was. So yeah. I think it's better to in split test it, see if it works. But, but you have the guarantee on your offer, yeah? Yeah, I use guarantee in my emails. Thanks. Removing the open rate tracking from now. Yeah, Thanks. do that. And then, yeah, you can hit me up if you have anything else. But uh, Austin, how do you go about split testing subject lines versus body copy? I would say like the way that you do it is with body copy and whatnot, I would make sure that the split tests you're doing are significant. Like don't split test minor stuff because it's probably not going to make like it's not worth your time. There's a lot bigger split tests you probably should be conducting. And the way I would do it is make sure that there are you're not like mixing a bunch of stuff. So if you're split testing a subject line, just exact same body copy with different subject lines. And then if you want to split test the body copy, make a different campaign and then split test the specific thing you're trying to split test. Don't, you know, split test 18 different things and the data is going to get all muddled. Just make it very clear and very direct. So hopefully that answers your question. My question is now when it comes to not putting links, right, um, in emails, what about your email address in your signature? So let's say if I uh, send it from joe.com, all right, and then however, my email address is gojo.com, but I put gojo.com in, in. So is that okay? No, I would say just any links or any any sort of link at all is, is probably something you want to avoid. 
It's definitely so, not going to help you. So do not put the email address within the link. Yeah, that's correct. Now, now, secondly, when it comes to the unsubscribe link, um, I do not put unsubscribe to this link. Instead, I put um, click here to opt out from receiving any future emails, which is a link as well. Is that fine? So I, that still hurts deliverability. The way that I recommend is using like a text-based opt-out saying like, hey, if you don't want to get any more emails from me, reply, no thanks, or reply, unsubscribe. Because then you're still getting the opt-out, but you're not including a link. And in, in the US, at least the, the laws say that that's compliant. That helped a lot. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to go Tim's question. Hey, Matt, would love to know your thoughts on lead magnets and all that clay personalization. Does it depend on market sophistication? Yeah, I, I, we we're, we're rehashed a lot of this stuff. I think a lot of the question about personalization, the 80-20 that everyone needs to know on personalization. Yes, it's important. Yes, it helps. But a lot of times the thing that outweighs it is the amount of emails you're sending, the relevance of your offer and the quality of your lead list. The personalization, I would say, in terms of priorities is like 10th on the list, right? Like making sure you're not landing in spam, making sure your lead list is high quality, making sure your offer is something that they want in the first place all go way above making sure your email has perfect personalization in clay.com yeah great tool it depends how you use it if you're using it to segment data to get super targeted lists that's a great use case if you're using it for ai personalization and it's helping a lot that's a great use case personally for the type of personalization where you're not segmenting in any way and just adding a chat gpt line it doesn't help that much in my experience when I, when I say like you, you can use clay.com and get really killer results. If you do segmentation with personalization on top of each other, like not, it's not as simple as just pasting an AI first line and clay can help with that. But I'd say for most people, the easier things to work on are your offer and your targeting. So that's all I really have to say about that. Jacob, how's your signature look? If it doesn't contain links, we already cover that. Should the first email be really short? I would say just split test it. The exact way your email should be formatted. It depends on a lot of factors, like, you know, the audience you're reaching out to, if you have something important to say. And yeah, I, I would just say like split test long email, short email, see what works better. Typically we see short emails work better, but also a point is don't make your emails artificially short. If you make your email short, if you just have a one sentence email, but it's really vague versus a four sentence email, but it includes really important things, that's going to outperform. I'll look for school. We covered that. Assuming your price point is very competitive. Do you, would you suggest using the price in your copy? A hundred percent. So like if you're selling a tool that's like, or a product or whatever, and it's like $99, $100, less than $500, I would a hundred percent put that in the email because that's like a unique selling point. But if your service is like in the thousands, then I, I probably wouldn't, unless it's ridiculously contextually based on your, your service. Uh, will this be sent for recording? Yes, this is going to be on YouTube. Hi, everyone that's watching this on YouTube right now. I use USD and so dollar. Does domain forwarding hurt my email deliverability? Um, Not that I know of. I don't, I haven't seen anything that has led or indicated that. I forward my domain's main domain. Yeah, that's best practice. So, and if that, I always go back to a lot of things people worry about. It's like, Oh, if I make these look like domains and point it back to my main domain, is it going to hurt it? If it did hurt it, then everyone would go out there, make a bunch of fake domains of their competitors and forward it all to them and just destroy their, their reputation. So I think most like tech companies understand that they don't want to have um, stuff like that, that, you know, can hurt, hurt other people. If you had to restart your agency today, what niche sub niche would you target? How do you make it as relevant as possible? Niche sub niche is a big question uh, for the people that run agencies. I would target people that you have the most personal experience with. So my first client was an IT company. Is it because the IT companies are the best niche ever? No, it's because I used to work at said IT company and I just asked the boss like, hey, can I do this for you? So that was the best way that I got started for, you know, if you work at a B2B company, that's a great place to start. If you have niche industry experience, like when I talk with my IT client, I can geek out about all the, you know, niche IT, MSP, you know, all that type of stuff versus if, you know, you take a stranger and you start talking about IT stuff, it, it's gibberish. Um, So it really just depends on your background, I'd say is one thing. And I would say the other thing on niche is there's no end all be all niche. Like, oh, hey, target marketing agencies. Well, everyone did that. Now, if you reach out to a marketing agency, most of them are going to say, I've gotten 50 of these emails today. So I would just target people that you have understanding in. And if you're lost, you have no understanding in any niche or sub niche, I would just look at other Legion providers or whatever, look at their cases. So like going back to the example I said earlier of like, who should you be targeting? It's people that you've closed in the past. So if you have 10 clients, just target more of those people. Or if you're just starting, 
find competitors, look at who their best case studies are, and then target those type of people. So, you know, if you look at my case studies, I work with a lot of marketing agencies. I work with a lot of staffing agencies. I work with people everywhere in between. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best industry, even looking at my case studies. There's a zillion industries. And the best answer I'd give you is target broad and then get on calls with people. And you'll realize that sometimes the niche doesn't matter as much as their offer. Like there's a lot of bad marketing agency niches, like sub niches within marketing agencies that I'd never work with versus IT companies, which in the lead gen space is broadly known as like a very hard niche to get results for. There's really good sub niches in there, like people that have a really strong product or service, but I, I would just go broad and then if you have any sort of previous expertise, target those people. If you don't go broad and then, you know, just see, see what sticks from there. Yeah. It's also, I kind of have another quick question if I could go ahead. quick. Yeah. Yeah. So I've had a, I'm offering like a lead magnet and it's been ripping positive replies, but then a lot of those people end up ghosting. I've tried using sub sequences as well to like keep reaching out to them so they can maybe book a call, but mm -hmm. like a lot of them just end up ghosting. And I'm wondering, like, should I be sending over the lead magnet? before I hop on a call? Because I've gotten advice, like don't send anything until you actually book a call. So mm -hmm. like, what do you kind of do when you're offering lead magnets? It depends on the lead magnet. I know like a lot of the Loom guys will like send the Loom out before they book a call. But like you said, like that happens where you just send them the thing they asked for and they don't end up booking a call. There's a couple philosophies there. It's like either you could get it and say, hey, I'm not giving this to you unless you get on a call, which obviously is going to reduce the amount of people that are interested, but you're probably going to get more calls. Or another option is you try and get as many yeses as possible, like what you're doing, and then not only follow up with them, cold call them. Because now you have this big pool of people that are semi-warm. And so you can just cold call and say, hey, yeah, yeah. I just sent you over this free lead, you know, I sent you over the free lead list or sent you over the free whatever. And then, you know, now you have an in, you have a reason to call them. Yeah. So I'm doing a lead list and I just, I like watch some live coaching on uh warm calling. So I think I'm going to start doing that because I think that could be really effective. Yeah. I would try warm calling. Another thing I would try is manual LinkedIn outreach. Go find their LinkedIn and say, Hey, just want to connect because uh, of the email I sent you. And then you can have a conversation. Like hit them on all the channels after they've shown interest. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate you. Hey, we sent a big client selling an e-com apparel, blah, blah, blah. Deliverability is good. We tested everything. Do you have any ideas why this campaign might not work? We leverage all the case studies and email, test many angles. There's a million reasons why, like you'd have to do a deliverability audit. You got three people interested from 15K emails, which is not good. Like talking about the KPIs earlier, uh, we want to be hitting one meeting book for every thousand, you know, 1500 emails sent. So you're, you're kind of way off the mark there. Part of it is that you're in the e-commerce space, but I would imagine that it's very light, like meta ads as a service without any sort of add-on, which is what it looks like they're selling. It's just a very tough service to sell because you don't have very much differentiation. Like a lot of people have meta ads providers. It's probably just the unique, going back to like volume offer relevance, it's probably the offer piece. Like you just need to frame it in a more attractive way because case studies definitely help. So I have all data in CRM that is unresearched. So one suggested that to make mass emailing and see who replied, that's how you figure out if it's the ideal client. Yeah, so you could, I honestly would just scrape new data unless you know it's it's good. I mean, you could throw emails out to it, but it's hard to write good email copy if your data isn't relevant or targeted. You know, if yeah, they have old data from like previous customers and you can reach out and say, hey, I know you purchased it from us in the past. If it's just random people, I just scrape completely new data. Yeah, it's random data from the old company. Now it's reopened, so it's very messy. Yeah, I'd probably so... just scrape new data if I were you. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so quick question. When you're split testing different angles with emails, how many do you run through before you know to kill it? I would do minimum thousand emails to each split test. That's like bare minimum. Ideally, you want more because you just want like a good sample size. What are you looking for in terms of like reply rate with that? The the things you're looking for is just like, and you can Google this like statistical significance calculator and you can see like, mm -hmm. okay, if we sent 5,000 emails to each uh, variation, one email or one variation booked four meetings, the other one booked one, I you can plug well, it through the calculator, but you're going to see pretty quickly that it's going to say the four one is statistically significant and you should kill the other one. Or if it's close, then you probably need to let it run more. So the, the rates you're looking for, it's just, you're just looking for one performing better than the other. You're not looking for like a fixed reply rate necessarily. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, for sure. And also with the follow-up. So this is something I've had challenges with when you get someone that says they're interested, right? And mm -hmm. they're like, well, can you tell me a little bit more information? 
So I got into that trap of like giving too much information and I watched mm -hmm. one of your other videos and it was, you know, just pretty, I think it was that Eamon video that you kind of did the whole, there's a whole flow of the, the workflow for him. And um, you should, you just basically showed a really short kind of selling the call. Ultimately, what do you do in terms of if some, you send an email out, it's a short kind of just a short to the point email to sell that call. And what do you do with follow-up if they just don't respond to that at all? So yeah, I would, you, you just continue with like, you do short bumps, you plug in cases, you plug in relevant stuff. The whole point yeah. is you need to sell the call. Like right. I was mentioning to someone earlier, there's the funnel, which is you're getting someone to the next step. So right. if you are doing things, they're getting them further, like answering their questions is not pushing them down the funnel. It's like, you know, you're, you're going on a sidetrack. So every email or most, I would say 90% of the times when you're replying to someone, it should end in a call to action of, do you want to get on a call? Because if you just go down, like at the point where you just answer everyone's questions back and forth, now you're basically conducting the sales call on the email and you're right. going to do a really poor job of actually converting people. So you give them like two or three bullet points and then just push the call. Yeah. And if they don't respond to that, you wait like a day or two and then just come back with something else and just be like, yeah, essentially there's, there's some nuance to it, but yeah, that's basically sure. what you're doing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. I think that's it. Yeah. Man. Hello. Uh, I have awesome. one question. Uh, how many, how many clients can a single person can like handle like one person team? How many clients they can manage according to you? I mean, it depends on the service. You're, the, there's probably a, a million factors. So are you talking specifically with cold email? Lead B2B down? cold email. I mean, it depends on your, I know people who can't handle more than five people. I know people who handle like, I don't know, 15, 20. It, it really just depends. Like you have to just test your limits. And if you have things more streamlined, you can handle more. Uh, you really just have to test and see. My personal limit to where I started hiring team out was probably close to 10 clients. Okay. So we have to do some auto, uh, auto like automate some processes, I guess. Yeah. To reach 10 clients. Yep. That's correct. How do you use Airtable to do reporting and tracking? It a lot of my Airtable stuff is custom, so you just have to. Talk, I would you know talk to a consultant or someone specific to that and build out your your flow accordingly. All that stuff is just really custom. And I use this project management and pretty much everything. How about high quality content offers, eBooks, white papers? Yeah, you can send those out as a lead magnets. I'll wrap it up here with Grant's question. Can you outline how you arrived? At the decision of 50 total emails per day, I've seen your emails getting banned at sending more than 100 emails per day, but below that hasn't been an issue. Also, do you alternate the email that you send from uh, each time? So yeah, I would say how I came to 50 emails per day is it's just what we've seen working. Um, if you're sending 100 emails per day and the KPIs are good, then go for it. I've personally just seen that it doesn't work well over time. So the example or the analogy I give is like a speed limit, right? So if you're if you're driving down the road and the speed limit is 50 miles an hour and you go 100 miles an hour, you can probably do that for you know a while and not get pulled over. But at a certain point, we've seen that lead to account bans or increased chance that you're laying in spam folder or, or blacklist or a million different things. If you actually have more receptive prospects to your emails, then you actually have a little bit more flex and how many you can send. If you have poor email copy, your, your deliverability actually goes down too. Also, do you alternate the inbox that you send from each month? Yes, that helps, but we personally don't do that. And that's part of the reason why we send lower amounts is so we don't have to do that. But awesome. Cool, guys. Uh, we're 20 minutes over here. This is a great first run of, of answering these questions. If you guys want to respond to any of the newsletter email stuff that I sent out, give any sort of feedback on the calls. Might run some more of these in the future, uh, depending on how receptive some of you guys are to it. But yeah, appreciate you guys a ton. Appreciate the the big turnout here. We got 40 people left in here. It looks like we we're capped out at the Zoom meeting at one point. But yeah, if you have anything else, shoot me something in the emails. Appreciate you guys a ton. Quick plug for my agency, anevilmarketing.com. If you're looking for any cold email stuff done for you, you can check it out there. If you want consulting, you can you know respond to one of my emails and we could set something up. But appreciate you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you so much.